radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, man. How you doing? How you doing? Today's Monday, August 15th, 2022. Tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed. <laughs> I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and Unex Networks, Race Hobbs. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? Man, I've waited 27 years for tonight's show. Tonight, we have very special guest, Dr. Jonathan Reed is here. We're going to be talking about his 1996 ET encounter. Incredible. Tomorrow night, we're off air. I've still got to work. I'm going to be over at UPARS in Los Angeles in Studio City. I'll be speaking over there and you can get uh tickets last minute i guess if some are still available the links are below and you can go and visit uparsla.org and uh, i think they have a meetup page too as well and and you can just show up at the door and see if you can get in we've got seating for 200 it's going to sell out and i'll see everybody there tomorrow night we were going to broadcast live uh from there uh, there's some logistics that uh, stepped in the way. So tomorrow night, we're going to run a best of replay. And uh, and then I'm just going to go and, and not have any stress of a live show. I, I just get to hang out with everybody over at UPAR. So that is uh, tomorrow night right here in Los Angeles, California. Again, the links are below. And uh, now the weekend of September 16th, I'll be in Joshua Tree for a private sky watch. And if you want to try to get an invite to that, it's coming up in, oh, man, uh, in exactly a month. You can go to Forbidden Knowledge. That's with a four. ForbiddenKnowledgeClub.com and mint yourself some NFTs. I think you've got to do 10. And you'll get your black card and get an invite. And then right after that, I'll be in Egypt. I'm going over to Egypt for a couple of weeks uh, with uh, 80 Friends and Billy Carson. That is going to be amazing. Um, and then coming up uh, in April uh, 2023, it's April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I will be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at the Sea Cruise. And lots of amazing speakers, uh, including Scott Walter and Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chavez is going to be there, and a bunch of other speakers. So, And the links for the cruise or down below. Uh, right before that, in February, of course, I will be hosting uh, the Conscious Life Expo right here in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Hilton at the Los Angeles Airport at LAX. I do that every year, and that's coming up in February. So there you go. I want you to get your free membership right now to the UnX Network. It's easy to do. Go to unxnetwork.com. And uh, get signed up. You'll get the free monthly newsletter. You get access to their blog and content and event notices. Free digital copy of their quarterly magazine. 
It's all simple to do. Go over to the unxnetwork.com and get yourself that digital copy of the magazine because this month it is all about time travel. So unxnetwork.com. Now, Eden Pure uh, made the announcement uh, to me over the weekend that they are now having their BOGO sale. That's right. Buy one, get one free. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm. And I think I'm up to like five of these things now. So you can get one now. Buy three, get three free. Buy five, get five free right now. And free shipping. The links are below. And the promo code is FaderBogo, B-O-G-O, which means buy one, get one free. Absolutely amazing. It has transformed my house and my car. That's it. That's it. I it is it's so funny how uh I'll leave the house, go shopping, go do something, come back a couple hours later, you know, and you know, you're acclimated to the and you walk in and go, Oh, the thunderstorms. So get yours now. Buy one, get one free. Her BOGO special is back. Promo code is Fader BOGO. Links to everything, all of our sponsors on the show, everything is in the description box below. It's also over on our website over at jimmychurchradio.com. Visit all of our sponsors. Become a Fader Knot. Become a member. You can do that there over on the website. You can get the podcast. The podcast is just $2 per month. And you have access to almost eight. 1800 shows. That's crazy to me, right? I think it's 1800. Is it 1700? I don't know, man. It's a lot of shows. And and you get the app and everything else. So, uh yeah, you can get the podcast, you can get the membership. If you get the membership, you can download episodes and everything is commercial free. That's right. Let's get to the breaking news. Oh, Follow me on Twitter at JChurch Radio. Now, let's get to the breaking news. Oh, the sandbox is hashtag F2B right there on Twitter. Or you can hit one of the chat rooms. Or uh, you can post a question at hashtag F2BQ. Now, let's get to the breaking news. Or you can follow me on Instagram at JChurch Radio. <laughs> I'm in a great mood. Dr. Jonathan Reed is here tonight. It's going to be an amazing show. I've got a lot of images, too, that uh, Jonathan has sent me. And uh, we're going to go through all of that tonight. And he will be with us at the bottom of the hour. Now, let's get to the breaking news. Anne Hesh has died after her car crashed into a Los Angeles home and erupted into flames 10 days ago on August 15th. Uh, she was declared brain dead and taken off life support yesterday, today. Uh, she has died. She was 53 years old. Tragic. Tragic. Nobody really knows how it happened. The, the car crash. All right. Well, Artemis, back in the news. Now, everybody knows I went to Vandenberg over the weekend, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, while no human crew, Artemis, we're going back to the moon. Okay, we're going back to the moon. While no human crew will travel aboard NASA's Artemis 1 mission, that doesn't mean that the Orion spacecraft will be empty. When the Space Launch System rocket and Orion capsule scheduled for liftoff on August 29th set off on a trip beyond the moon, the spacecraft will be carrying some special items on board. Inside Orion will be three mannequins, toys, and even an Amazon Alexa, along with historic and educational items. The mission, which will kick off the Artemis program with the aim of eventually returning humans to the moon very shortly, in, in a, a little over a year, carries on the tradition that began in the 1960s of NASA's spacecraft bearing mementos. The tradition includes the Voyager's probe's uh, gold record. You remember that? Perseverance Rover's microchip of 10.9 million names, including mine. Artemis 1 will carry 120 pounds of mementos and other items in its official flight kit. All soon to be auctioned off at Sotheby's in New York. I'm kidding. Not really. Not really. 
All right. Check this out. With only a $300 piece of equipment and legal, that's the key word here, legal access to an uplink station, you too can broadcast war games from a decommissioned Canadian satellite. That's what a hacking enthusiast, uh, Carl Kosher, showed everyone over the weekend at the annual DEF CON hacker meetup in Las Vegas. After being granted access to an abandoned uplink facility, Kosher and friends used a software-defined radio called HackRF to connect with Canada's defunct ANIC F1R satellite last year, and they said they just had some fun with it, end quote. Kosher and the hacking group Shady Tell obtained both a license to use an out-of-use uplink facility along with the ANIC F1R satellite's transponder lease. Utilizing their new satellite, the group was able to stream the talks that uh, from last year's TorCon hacking conference in San Diego, and they did that during the day while showing fan-favorite films at night. Extra bandwidth also allowed them to set up a phone conference line with a dedicated number to call and broadcast across the continent. (laughs) That's insane to me. Uh, It's a lot of work, but I guess it's fun. All right. Well, for the first time, scientists have named a heat wave. They called it Zoe. The Spanish scientists bestowed the moniker on a heat wave that sent temperatures soaring to 112 degrees Fahrenheit in Seville between July 24th and July 27th. It's a new effort to alert the public to extreme temperatures and warn them of the dangers. Well, you know, it's hurricanes. Now it's heat waves. U.S. gasoline prices continue to fall, and they will keep falling, raising the possibility of gas below $3 a gallon in much of the country before the end of the year. The national average for a gallon of regular gas stood at $3.96 this past Monday, only down a fraction of a cent where it stood on Sunday. Still, that decline maintained a streak of 62 consecutive days of falling gas prices. The average national price has fallen $1.06 or 21% since since hitting a record high of $5.02 a gallon back on June 14th. Here in Southern California... Gas is a bargain at five fifty a gallon. If it gets below five bucks, we're going to be happy here in Southern California. Yeah, we'll do the happy dance. <laughs> it's so fun. I- I'll contact my friends around the country. How much you paying for gas? Hey man, uh, you know out here, man, it's a buck fifty a gallon. It's a buck sixty. It's a buck ninety. How much you paying? I'm like seven thirty nine, and everybody laughs. And here in Southern California. We're just used to it, getting gouged. That's it. That's it. I'm just going to leave that right there. So as you complain about gas prices, you know, save it. Come out here. Rent a car and fill it up. <laughs> just go through, uh, go through what I go through. Let's get the show cracking on this day in history. 1979. I remember this like it was yesterday. Because Apocalypse Now opens in theaters. Now, there's a lot of hype behind the film at that time. And I lived on an army base. And uh, so I watched it in Panama at the Fort Amador Theater for 50 cents. That's how much it costs to go see a movie subsidized by the Department of Defense. 50 cents. And my life changed that day. I, 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 man, I don't know if, you know, like The Shining messed with me. You know, certain films have messed with Rosemary's Baby messed with me when I was a kid, The Last House on the Left. Um, and, and, but, but Apocalypse Now, wow, it, uh, it just seems so real, you know, and it was right after the Vietnam War ended. It just, Wow, it just it just messed with me. But again, on this day in 1979, fader fact. 
All right, this is for you fader knots out there. Are you ready? A linguist a linguistic study has discovered that workers in Antarctica have developed a new accent. That's right. This is the result of them being isolated as a group and interacting with only one another for several months. It's called Antarctican, which is better than Antarctican't. And that is your fader fact. Tonight, we have very special guest, Dr. Jonathan Reed is here. Going to be talking about his 1996 ET encounter tomorrow night. We are off air. I'm taking the night off. Well, I'm not taking the night. I'm taking the night off here. I will be speaking at UPARS. And uh, yeah, I carry a certain amount of guilt about this. I get it. But you know what? I've earned it. Can I take a night off? (laughs) Ten years. How many nights off have I taken in 10 years? The only nights off that I've taken is like during a power outage or an earthquake or a riot, you know, something like that. But, man, I've ridden this thing through. So tomorrow night we're off air. You're just going to have to deal with it. And then Wednesday night, Adam Apollo is going to be here. We're going to be talking about the science and search for ET. Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. Now, um, uh, over the weekend, I talked about this. This happened on Friday. And I told everybody what uh, I was going to do, which is I was going to go out to Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base, which I found out after getting there. It's no longer called Vandenberg Air Force Base. It's called Vandenberg SFB, Space Force Base. Now, a couple of things to note about this. First off, um, I don't want to say a whole lot about this because there's, you know, privacy issues and things like that. But um, uh, Brad Harris was with me. I'm going to leave it at that. And, uh, and uh, you know, he is our staff photographer, by the way, and took some amazing images, including me getting rustled up by the space force police but um but putting that aside i didn't know that it was now the space force base and i'm 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 clearing security and uh had to give up my social security number by the way i was a little uncomfortable with that but anyway so apparently i passed the background check and and i and i and i'm looking at everybody there the staff and and i see sf right i see sf on every by the way i'm wearing my space force shirt got at the gift shop um so uh, it's not a gift shop i went to the px anyway space force right and uh, so i start looking around and i see it everywhere vandenberg sfb and that was pretty interesting um, and so anyway, uh, uh, I get my vehicle cleared. I get cleared. We drive onto the base and, oh, I left, left my ID. Uh, I, 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 I kept my, uh, paper ID that they gave me. So anyway, we're driving around the base and I start seeing things, you know, uh, uh, Delta 30 space force command, space force command, Delta 30, Delta 18. And, um, uh, the NRO National Reconnaissance Office saw that too as well. That was that was creepy town, and uh, but driving around and then you start to realize you see a lot of rockets. You see Space Command Center here. You see Launch Control over here, and and these big impressive, really nice base by the way, uh, very impressive facilities. But then you, it's not an Air Force base anymore. This is the Space Force. That's what Vandenberg is, and that that was that was an eye opener. So uh, we we go down we we go down to this beach, Vandenberg Beach, which is right next to where the launch is, and we are the only people there. It's just us and security. There's like six of us, eight of us, and uh, and 
I shot a video which has been posted on YouTube. I'm going to run the video now, um, and then I'll share my comments uh, with you afterwards. But uh, here is the video, and uh, let me get this up and running. Check this out. I want to thank Elon Musk for clearing out the beach for us today. We're the only ones here. And the rocket is sitting right out there. You can see it. And it's just us and a flock of seagulls. We're here at Vandenberg. We're at the beach at Vandenberg, about five miles away. And you can see it's starting to steam up. And it's lift off. Wow, that's incredible. What? Look how bright it is. Oh my God. I can feel the heat. <laughs> oh, that is crazy. Is that majestic or what? That was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Really? Hands down. So now, what about the booster? We're not going to see that, huh? It's going to land somewhere, hopefully. It's just on the rocket ship. I cannot believe. That was amazing. Brad, was that amazing? Mind blowing. You can't believe the, it until you see it. How about the thunder in the chest? It. The thunder in the chest, huh? Yeah, man. Wow. Once it kicks in, you know something serious is going on up there. You know, you know the trippy part uh, for me was how bright, you know, orange, yellow it was. It's like super bright, almost white. Crazy, crazy. Wow, that was that was amazing. SpaceX, hear it. Vandenberg Space Force Base 
And here with Brad Harris, of course. Hey, Brad, great day, man. Right on. Thanks for coming out, and uh, we'll have to do this again next time. This is incredible. And now I'm going to hit the uh, Space Force gift shop. Yeah, got to get a hat. Brad, say yo. I'll see you guys later. So there you go. It, it was incredible. And I, I will say this uh, with, with everything and, and how it went down. Um, I didn't expect uh, the brightness. You know, it, it, everything on TV and, and videos, it, it's toned down. Like this video here, it's toned down in person. Holy mackerel, man. So bright. Uh, it, it, it was. Um, but, the, but the other thing. And this video, uh, no adjustments on the volume. What you hear is is how it went down. So it was quite, you know. And then then the sound hit, and the vibrate <laughs> was not prepared for that. Uh, do you see these videos on TV? And as cool as they are, and you see the movies, and it, you're not you're not prepared. And so anyway. Um, I'm, I'm driving back. Uh, I'm driving back home. It's a three hour drive and I'm driving back and, and then it popped in my head. Gattaca. <laughs> it was the movie Gattaca for real. And so I was talking to uh, the security forces uh, there and you guys saw me post the pictures and stuff. And, and I asked, I said, how was it? How exciting is this for you guys? And everybody said the same thing, man. We do this like twice a month, man. It was like it was like that. Eh, yeah, it's cool, I guess, you know. But we do it all the time, and I I, I can't get over it. So we're invited back uh, to go and watch the SLS launch um, in September, and I'm not going to miss that. There is no way. But I've officially scratched and checked a box. On the bucket list. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, right here, Dr. Jonathan Reed. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break with our guest, Dr. Jonathan Reed. On the Game Changer and Unex Networks, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner 
over at jimmychurchradio.com. Right now, Eden Pier is having their famous BOGO deal on thunderstorm air purifiers. One listener wrote, It makes a huge difference in our cat litter box stink. I just wish I waited for the BOGO deal. I need another one. Well, now's the time. BOGO is back, so when you buy one thunderstorm, you get one free. No matter how many you buy, you buy two, you get two free. You buy five, you get five free. The thunderstorm will completely eliminate any odor, even the worst like pets, cigarette smoke, urine, and cooking. Now is the time to order. Eden Pierce buy one, get one free sale is one week only. With over 265,000 thunderstorms sold and countless five-star reviews, you know it works. People are buying several for around the home and even as gifts. Just go to EdenPureDeals.com and use discount code FADERBOGO. That's Fader Bogo, F-A-D-E-R-B-O-G-O. Bogo is buy one, get one free. That's EdenPureDeals.com, discount code Fader Bogo. And as always, shipping is free. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the UnXNetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the UnXNetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UnX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I am your host, Jimmy Church. What a great week we've got lined up. Even though I'm taking tomorrow night off, tonight Dr. Jonathan Reed is finally here. We're going to be talking about his 1996 ET encounter. Tomorrow night I'm off while I'm still working. And then Wednesday night, Adam Apollo is back. We're going to be discussing the science and the search for ET. All of that is Wednesday night. Thursday is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Tonight, it's Dr. Jonathan Reed. On October 15th, 1996, what all began as an innocent afternoon day hike in a nearby forest in Seattle, Washington, everything changed. Jonathan came face-to-face and directly encountered an extraterrestrial creature. Since 1996, Dr. Reed has spent the last 27 years lecturing to thousands in person and on international television, radio, and internet broadcasts. His experience has yielded more documented, verified evidence than any other close encounter case in history. The only case with verified, authenticated, documented photographs and video. And uh, you can go and follow Jonathan over on Facebook. I've got the links for that uh, down below and also over on social media. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Dr. Jonathan Reed. Jonathan, how you doing, young man? Very good, Jimmy. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We got you loud and clear. I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. I know it's been a long time coming. I apologize for that, but thank you for reaching out to me and making this happen. I'm I'm glad to be here, and uh, I support your efforts to try to bring you know some of this to life. So thank you. Yeah, and and thank you for that, and I really appreciate it. Before we get started, though, you get the first-time guest disclaimer. Okay, Uh yeah, here we go. Uh, Dr. Reed is just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. There you go. Well, we're already friends, but but we'll continue 
to be friends. How's that? So, um, uh, okay, before we get started, and I'm going to let everybody know uh, that there, this is probably going to be part one of a two-part uh, show. There's uh, so much to cover. Uh, we'll get as much in as we can tonight, and then uh, uh, we're going to do another show, and we're already uh, working on that now. But before I get there, you have found the fountain of youth, and you're not <laughs> sharing. And um, I, I, you look exactly the same as you did uh, 27 years ago. So, yeah, right? And, and so um, it, you dye the mustache. No. You dye not a bit. No. That's incredible. I mean, that's, uh, can, can I tell everybody how old you are? Sure. Dr. Reed is 70 years old. 70. Man, I mean, uh, you know what? <laughs> it's impressive. <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay. Better living through chemistry. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, uh, again, send me whatever you're drinking. I, I just want, I, I want a few sips of it because. Well, Dan Aykroyd vodka. I've got, I've got many bottles of that. So that's that the is. secret. He, okay. He's my friend, and he is a great producer of one of the world's best vodkas. So I recommend that. Yeah, it's it's amazing vodka. I, I, I'm a big vodka guy, and you know you can buy this. You know, yeah, expensive bottles of vodka, and then you drink the Aykroyd, and you're like, well, okay, right. And it's in a crystal skull. It's a beautiful uh, bottle, so it's worth keeping. I also, a friend of mine gifted me his uh, agave uh, vodka. Oh, yeah. It's in a black skull. Right. And so I had, and it's pretty good too as well. It's, it's sweet. It's sweet, but really, really, really tasty stuff. Okay. Now that we know your secret, yeah. <laughs> chilled vodka shots. Um, the I, I think it goes without saying that... Um, I have been asked many times over the years, uh, Jimmy, you know, you and Art Bell, uh, what, what was your favorite, you know, what's your favorite Art Bell moment? And I go, boop, 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 you know, and you are always, you know, you're right there. It, you're one of the first things uh, that I mention, And uh, that, that show um, at that time, shows, I should say, uh, plural, but certainly the first show. At that time, the internet was in its infancy. It was just starting, and and art uh, embraced the internet. And along with that broadcast were your images that started to come out on the net, and all of that painted uh, a picture. You know, it's theater of the mind, right? Where we are, Absolutely. yeah. And it uh, it is something that has uh, profoundly moved me over these years. And uh, I always wanted to talk to you. And here we are 27 years later, and I've got the opportunity to do this. So I want to say thank you. The honor and privilege is, is mine. No, and it's my honor to be with you. And, and I'd like to say, please jump in, in and out in this conversation as we're having it as friends. But I need to say that if it wasn't for Art Bell, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for a few other select people who helped me get here, uh, who have since passed. Robert Race, my partner for 25 years, passed in 2020, in December. Um, I, I've been lost without him. Uh, we were writing another book. I will finish it, but it's going to now take some time to go back and, and rekindle some of that. Art Bell truly was a pioneer, uh, had the gumption and the, the balls to take stories of the paranormal and give people a chance to tell what they knew, what they felt about it. And that, I, prior to this, I wasn't into ufology. I, I really, I was a doctor, developmental psychiatrics, child development, working in a major hospital, University of Washington Medical Center. Uh, just to give you a little background of my bio, uh, I started in San Diego State University, graduating with a special education, T 
teaching degree, I was fortunate to spend time with some people in the summer where they owned a, a summer camp for, for kids with disabilities. I worked at, had been working at a couple of years, and the, the head of that pulled me aside and said, Jonathan, what are you going to do with your life? And at the time, I thought, well, I'm going to be a teacher. And he said, what if there was more? What if you had the opportunity to do more? And I said, well, you know, tell me what you have in mind. And he said, well, I'd like you to pursue psychiatric care and psychology if I can help you. Would you be willing? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I transferred to UCLA and started in on their pre-med program, uh, loved it. Uh, prior to that, I was kind of a mediocre student. Uh, at that point, I excelled, got into their med school program, transferred to the University of Washington and graduated from all three of those universities. Um, I love what I do, uh, working with kids, developmental psychiatrics, child development was my forte, it was my gift. And I was a natural at it as well as being truly applicable to the situation. I could get in and talk with kids on their own levels and do some fantastic things. With the grace of God and a great team, you can do miraculous things. I did that from the time I graduated uh, in 85 till the time I left in 96. Um, when this event happened on October 15, 1996, which was a Tuesday, I had been working probably six days a week, almost 10 hours a day, which you do that as a physician. Um, there was a lot to be, to be had as work, both through the University of Washington Medical School and Children's Orthopedic Hospital, which I worked in between the two. Uh, my, my staff was made up of about eight to nine people who I was their department head in the end. Uh, I loved what I did. People either loved to work with me or they hated me because I had certain styles and ability to work that I felt really functionally worked with patient care. Um, so that was my life and I loved it. I was living what I considered to be my American dream. I had a good status in the community and in my, in my professional life and my friends, um, you, you reach a pinnacle where you feel like you're blessed because you have everything you need and, and you've earned that right. You, you've achieved something beyond what you ever expected to be able to achieve. And at the same time, giving back. If, but, you, if you could, uh, Jonathan, pull the camera closer to you for the microphone so I can just okay. speak a little bit better. Um, and uh, let, me, uh, let me actually start here because as you're going through um, the educational system and, and, and getting uh, your credentials and stuff, did you have any uh, interest in, in UFOs? Did you, did you know no. anything about the subject? No, in fact, it, it's odd because I was barely had time for interest other than academics. Um, I didn't even like science fiction, to be honest with you, because I was so busy in being involved in my career in, in all the edificy of that career. It needs an ongoing education, and you're constantly lurking, learning from your peers and from every other source, which being in conjunction with the University of Washington Medical School, which I taught at at a certain point, you just are immersed in your field. And I liked it so much, I tended not to shy too much away from that. My hobbies were community efforts, 
And personally, I was into sports cars. I decided that if I ever reached a point where I could afford it, I would start having some of the cars that I wanted, that I admired the engineering and, and the, the beauty of these older, sleek cars. And I, so I started to acquire them. And um, sometimes buying them in pieces and literally having friends of mine rebuild them who were mechanics. I was a weekend mechanic and I facilitated and kind of orchestrated what needed to be done. I'd buy them, I'd sell them, I'd drive them for sometimes as little as a month and then move on and buy another one to the point where I had made a little profit so I was driving on profit, but that was my hobby. And the other hobby was music. I had a friend who was a keyboard specialist who had been all around the world working with different bands. And him and I, being as close as we were, lived in the same city, we decided to build a digital studio, which was now just coming into its own. Uh, we could afford it. Uh, to have this as a real serious hobby. So we took our time and built a 100 channel analog and digital studio. And uh, with that, we pursued our, our love of music and development and writing. Uh, I can write music, but also play. I was forced to play classical piano when I was young, which I salute to my mother for giving that, that ability. Um, and we just loved this. We loved it as a, an escape from the real world into the world of an artistic ability, working with some of the greatest artists that were in our city, in and around Seattle, Washington. Uh, one of them that comes, uh, uh, Nancy, uh, the hearts, heart to heart music, uh, we knew uh, among many others, and we built all kinds of film score music, which we ended up being able to produce and sell to some, some independent filmmakers. And, but it was done as a love. It wasn't done as a job uh, after the fact. So. so if you built a digital studio, this is curious to me um, because I'm in the business too, um, and that revolution uh, started in in 93, uh, 94, at least this and the ADATs and Pro Tools uh, started to session eight. And that stuff was launched then. Your your encounter was in 1996. Yes. Um, so that was the period, right? Uh, when yeah, you, for, for you about know. 10 years, we had been making music on the side, like we were weekend musicians. Right, uh, right. My friend had a studio, a beautiful studio, built on his homestead. So it was easy access. There was nothing to rent. We bought all the state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, we had every name brand you can believe. My friend worked for the phone company as an engineer, as well as a keyboard player. And so he knew his stuff. His wife was a computer technician. She knew her stuff. So the integration of all these loves and abilities produced a, a pretty, uh, pretty kick-ass studio, if I will say so myself. Yeah, right on, right on. And obviously, you can see what I have here. I got exactly. I, I, I got admire. I admire what you've done and what you. You have, and I can certainly sympathize and understand how that is such a, a nice alternative to go to. Uh, I was never what I consider to be a good musician. I can play a little bit of a, a lot of things, but my forte was just the love of the process. I learned the engineering from my friend who him and I developed this ability. We did record some other people's music, so I was able to be part of that uh, as an engineer. And uh, we even brought in symphony members to play string parts and oboe parts, so we had live 
real non-synthetic parts to our music. Uh, it's easy to synthesize, but the warmth coming from the real instrumentation is incredible, as yeah. you know. Yeah, something has been lost these days uh, with that, and there's nothing like a, a, a real band. Um, just like anything else, we live in a digital world today. And, right. You know, movies, well, I, I love uh, the technology. You know what? I love a good CG fight couple of cartoon robots going at it for some reason <laughs> i'm entertained by that i know it's not real but it's 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 where we are today you know it's, it's part of it we live in a digital world i wanted to ask you this um as we uh we're gonna uh, uh come up on a break your home um uh you know with the freezer right that home um where was that in in seattle what part of town West Seattle toward Alki Point is where I, I grew up and had a homestead. My parents grew up in that area. My father was a Seattleite from birth. My mother was Swedish and had a Michigan heritage. So um, my dad was Jewish, had a light Jewish background. My mother had a Christian background. So I had the best of both worlds. Uh, religion was never forced on us past the early age of uh, nine or 10 going to Sunday school. Uh, but I did learn both religions and pursued it as an adult, learning all I could, both from Quran, both from uh, the Torah, both from the Bible as well. So I have an open mind. I am not into organized religion. I am into spiritualism as a as a, a light side of things. I try to look every at everything as a as an engineer or a scientist versus a theologian, uh, which I am not. I've gotten help from people who were professionals in religion because at times I had questions, like we all do. And I think it's good to question everything. I believe that. But I also know there's a lot I don't know, and I'm willing to say that, whether it's about my own experiences or anything else in my life. But when I don't know, I admit it, and I try to seek out those who can re-support my ideas and give me an education on what's going on. I want to know. I want to know just as much as anybody wants to know. And let me say this, too. When this all happened to me, I was a doctor. I loved my life the way it was. I was very content. And my world was turned upside down in a matter of hours to where I, I could not even believe that this was happening, that this paradigm had shifted so greatly, 180 degrees, to where I felt out of my element, uncomfortable, unsure of what I was even experiencing at all, whether I had lost my concept of logic altogether. So I questioned everything that was going on. But nevertheless, I had to continue. I had to survive. And that's what I was doing. I was literally going step by step to, to just get through it, if nothing else. And then later on, going back and reflecting on, you know, what was it exactly that happened? Because I didn't know. It was extremely emotional and extremely difficult for me. People have a tendency to think, oh, well, he, he, he survived this and he's a hero for doing this. I'm not. I am just a normal guy who is so much out of my element that I had to regroup minute to minute. I had to revert back to thinking about things in my life that made sense just for me to stay in, stay with some sanity, some logic of what was going on. And that's the only way I have survived it. The, um, the day, uh, when we come back after the break, we're going to get uh, straight into uh, the, the event. But uh, let me ask you this. I've got 60 seconds before the break. When you woke up that morning, right, October 1996, anything seemed different to you? 
No. In fact, my life uh, was so much a routine. My hours were li literally set up for me to go to the hospital, to work my 10 or 12 hours, to come home, to have breaks, to have lunch, to take care of my dog and my family. My mother and father at the time were still alive. I had a girlfriend that I was madly in love with that I thought was my life. Um, so my life was full. It was complete. And, and, but nothing changed that day other than I decided it was a, a nice day. It was a nice fall day. And my dog, Susie, my golden retriever, seven-year-old golden retriever, who was my companion everywhere I went, in my work and driving in the car, everywhere. She was almost like a, a child to me. Um, everyone loved her. I just decided, you know what, we're going to go for a hike, go for a run, like we had so many other times, to a place, a pristine place in the, in the forest nearby where I worked and, and lived. So that day was normal like any other until 2.57 in the afternoon. Okay, let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, after 27 years, I finally get a chance to sit down and talk to Dr. Reed. And when we come back after the break, we're going to get straight to the events of that day. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer and Unex Networks. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. <laughs> You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Right now, Eden Pure is having their famous BOGO deal on thunderstorm air purifiers. One listener wrote, It makes a huge difference in our cat litter box stink. I just wish I waited for the BOGO deal. I need another one. Well, now's the time. BOGO is back, so when you buy one thunderstorm, you get one free. No matter how many you buy, you buy two, you get two free. You buy five, you get five free. The thunderstorm will completely eliminate any odor, even the worst like pets, cigarette smoke, urine, and cooking. Now is the time to order. Eden Peer's buy one, get one free sale is one week only. With over 265,000 thunderstorms sold and countless five-star reviews, you know it works. 
people are buying several for around the home and even as gifts. Just go to EdenPureDeals.com and use discount code FaderBogo. That's FaderBogo, F-A-D-E-R-B-O-G-O. Bogo is buy one, get one free. That's EdenPureDeals.com, discount code FaderBogo. And as always, shipping is free. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the UnXNetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the UnXNetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed is with us. 27 years ago, I heard uh, Dr. Reed on Coast to Coast with Art Bell. Changed me. Profound impact. Here we are so many years later. He is now a guest on Fade to Black. This is amazing. And uh, right before the break, I had asked Dr. Reed... Uh, was the day any different, right? Did, did you notice anything different? And that's where we left off. And well, his answer was no, it's just a, just another day, just another day. And so you get your golden retriever, Susie, right? Right. And, uh, and I have, uh, uh, an image here. Let me, uh, let me pop this up, uh, for everybody so you can, uh see Susie and uh this is Susie everybody now is this uh this is I keep calling it the freezer house right but yes no that's that's not the place oh that's that, it. That's, that's not it. the freezer house that was at a friend's house but uh Susie was a golden re- seven year old golden retriever that I'd had for about uh six and three quarter years i found her she adopted me she turned up on my doorstep one rainy night i took her in and she never left she was a brilliant dog truly dedicated and kind and gentle i mean if somebody would have broken to my house she would have probably licked them to death in happiness but uh non-aggressive but just a wonderful wonderful dog so uh, let's start here. Uh, you you head out for this hike. Um, uh, I'm assuming you're in your car, right? Okay. I was at work. I happened to be at work. And uh, it was about 1, 1. 15, 1. 30 in the afternoon. I just decided I didn't have a lot of work to do on schedule. So I told um, my executive assistant, clear the board. I'm going to I'll work tomorrow and I'm going away. We're just going to go for a ride. I needed to go to the bank. I need to run some errands. And as I was doing that, I just made the decision, hey, let's go where we always go. Let's go to the woods, about 45 minutes drive away from where I work. Uh, Susie's sitting right next to me in the passenger seat in my Jeep. Uh, we, we drove, we went to the forest, we parked my Jeep where we always did. We've done this many times before. This was in Snoqualmie Pass area, which is, again, about 50 miles east of Seattle. 
Uh, it's a, a very beautiful, pristine area right at the tree line, uh, old growth forest, uh, not a park as such, but since then has become more so. But at the time it was a closed logging road where I parked my Jeep and we just got out and started walking at that point. Uh, you know, dog to run, this is a good place for a dog to be off the leash, to run and jump and be, be do dog stuff that they always do. And like I said, she was a wonderful dog. She'd run after squirrels and raccoons, uh, just to play, just very playful, uh, bark occasionally in excitement but not an aggressive dog at all. And we'd done this for a little over an hour from walking this beautiful path in the wilderness. I had taken some pictures of some deer during this time. And like I said, we've done this many times. Well, all of a sudden Susie took off running, which wasn't unusual. She'd done that before out of my sight, but I could hear her. Um, but the barking changed, her barking sound changed, became more aggressive, more severe, which gave me cause to wonder, to be concerned, but not excessively because, you know, it would stop. She'd come running back. Everything would be fine. But this time she didn't come running back and the barking changed, the tone when you have a dog, you learn their voices. You learn to appreciate what they are saying, what they are verbalizing. And I could tell this was different. Either something had her treed or backed up in a corner or she was treeing something. Uh, we have cats, wild cats in the area. We have raccoons. We have even bear, a lot of bear. So, and this was late in the season. Uh, like I said, October 15th, uh, it was an overcast day, but it was a warm, warm, late Indian summer kind of that year. So I followed the sound of her continuing down the path to see if I could, you know, untangle her, if she had become involved with some kind of a, a wild critter. And I couldn't find her, but I could hear her. And the barking progressed in such a way that I did become very, very concerned. I got to a point where I found a, a tree branch laying along the path that was about six feet long and about the same diameter as a baseball bat. And I figured, okay, I'm going to pick this up in case I have to untangle her from this event, whatever it might be, whatever she might be doing. The tree canopy and the ground cover, the foliage on the ground is very dense, different from many places in the United States, very thick. And, and it provides cover to where you can't see sometimes what's in front of you 10 feet. And I continued to vector in on her sound to just follow the sound of her barking, which now became yelping in, in desperation. So I ran, I dropped my day pack and I ran to her up to the top of this rise. And I knew she was really, really close. There was dense bushes all around me. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to go right down through this thicket, through these bushes. And it's where I heard all this commotion. And it was loud and it was fierce and it was, it was scary. It was very aggressive. So I crashed through the bushes and right in front of me, not six feet in front of me, I could see her with this small figure, something that I, I didn't know what it was. It was childlike in size. It was very dark, uh, dark figures. It had what I could see to be two arms and two legs, but very small, like four to five feet at the most in height. But what was curious is she had, it looked like my dog had this creature by the arm, by the wrist. And at that second, I saw him 
throw my dog back and forth with one arm like this so fast that it became nothing but a blur. And I could hear her growling and yelping and he stopped for a second. Something reached out from this black arm, this black suit covering 99% of his body, grabbing the top of her head and tearing her head in half. Blood, sinew, everything being spread all over with just the pressure of her body, her, her blood pressure spraying blood everywhere, killing her as she screamed in pain. This was the most terrible thing I had ever seen. And it, it traumatized me. Was I in shock? Well, I was then. And all that was in my mind was, I got to stop this. And I yelled frantically, Susie, let go, let go. Because I thought she had him by the arm, but in effect, he had her. And at that point, her body started to fall and to Latinize, almost imploding into a hole that opened up in her neck. A very surreal, unreal looking thing that her body started folding in on this hole. And she became smaller, 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 and finally falling to the ground in a white ash, a white dense powdery ash on the ground. Insanity, this was insane. I took another step, grabbed this branch and hit this creature in the head as hard as I could. Because to me, I was next, it was gonna kill me next and I was gonna kill it for what it was doing to my Susie. Okay, so I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, look, uh, we're all, all happening within seconds. I mean, seconds. And uh, the the knock on the head. I mean, when you go through all of that, now now you're in. I'm I'm guessing here, but now you're in autopilot, right? Absolutely. You're not, yeah, you're not Absolutely. in control. I so, was in shock. I was not thinking. This was not a foresight of conclusion to do this. I don't even know what took over in me other than rage. To see something brutally torn apart in front of you causes nothing but insanity in your mind to, to take over and either defend yourself or defend what's going on to the person or the, the dog that was my person, that was my child for so long. I wanted to kill this thing as best I could. And, so, and so what took over was just this raw emotion, not foresight, not logic. It just was emotion. I hit it in the head. I almost missed it. When I swung this thing, I swung it one time and connected with the back of its skull which split its skull open, blood, sinew, fluid, brain, cranial material flying all over on me on the ground, and it fell back. And as it fell back, it screamed this just insane scream. But so did I. Mine was in triumph for hitting it, for knocking it down. And at that exact moment, I fell to the ground, Jimmy, in sickness. Cryptic, crippling sickness hit my body so much that it, it kind of shocked me because as the branch connected to its head, I immediately became ill, violently ill, diarrhea, breathing beyond any capacity that I could have imagined, hyperventilating stomach problems, throwing up. I, all my muscle control left my body and I fell to my knees in this moment. And I could not get up. I could not stop panting, trying to breathe. I thought I was going to die. I actually thought this is the death of me. And I couldn't realize what was going on. Nothing fit in this paradigm. The ground felt spongy and wet and damp. 
and the sound of this whole arena that I was used to with birds and air going through the trees was gone. All of those sounds were gone as if this area had been a dead, dead zone. So I was out of my element. I was totally, and I couldn't move. I was on the ground face to face, not three feet from the face of this creature. Was the creature uh, moving at this point? No. As far as I was concerned, it was dead. It was dead. Uh, the, the hole in the back of its head was enormous. It was two and a half by three inches in diameter. There was a skull flap and skin pulled back and cranial material, brain material oozing from the hole. So I had no feeling other, and it wasn't breathing. I could not see it breathing or moving in any way. So I feel it was dead and I was happy. Right, we, we have some images of, of, of the back of uh, the creature's head. We'll we'll show that in in a bit. Um, what what happens next? Do you well, the next, do... next thing is I I just tried to regain a little bit of composure. I tried to slow my breathing down because I knew if I didn't, I would go into terrible shock. So I tried to slow down, not even thinking about really what was happening because my mind didn't want to go there. That would have taken me over the edge again. Uh, what about uh, the thought of uh, a second creature or a third? I I did not I did not impose that. All I was dealing with one, and the one that I was dealing with was, for my best ability, was dead in front of me. So I no longer was concerned with that as much as I was concerned with my own body. Uh, I I had this feeling of having a heart attack. Uh, and and just going into shock was what I was scared of. Jimmy, this is 50 miles from the nearest facility that I could go in a hospital. This was out in the middle of the forest. Mm -hmm. And I had walked for an hour before where I parked my, my Jeep to where this occurred. And I noticed my watch had stopped exactly at a certain time. It had froze when this happened but in this area with the dark tree canopy out in the middle of nowhere it gets dark fast and i was concerned whether i could get 200 feet back up the path more so than an hour uh, so what i did is i just started to try to calm down i knew i had some water in a day backpack that i had just a few feet away so I went, started to move toward that. I heard another sound in the area and I thought, oh, it's a hiker. It's another hiker or a camper. And maybe they can help me because I needed help. So I listened. I tried to vector in where the sound was coming from, but then I'd fall back down or fall against the tree. I actually ripped my shirt at one point falling against the bark of a tree. I kept listening for this sound and I heard, heard this harmonic, low ebbing tone, this harmonic tone. I first thought, well, it's somebody with a boom box, somebody with a radio that they're playing, that they're walking along. I thought that would be great, but I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't see anybody, but nevertheless, this sound was coming. This sound was apparent. It was so deep and so low, I could almost feel it in my backbone. It was such a low ebbing harmonic. And I kept looking up and falling to my knees and trying to get up and falling down. No muscle control in my legs and my pelvis. It was terrible. And so I literally crawled around to where I could kind of see like 75 feet away through the brush I could see some trees that almost looked like a mirage. If you've ever seen a mirage where the, where the light bends, whatever you're looking at, just a little bit. And that was what I was looking at. But that didn't make any sense either because it was a dark canopy covering the area. 
And why would there be this this illusion, this bending of the light? But nevertheless, I crawled toward it. I could still hear this harmonic tone. I got up. I walked through more of the brush. I lost my footing and I fell down, which was just kind of a little uh, hill going down. And as I fell down, I grabbed on to what was above me. And there was this black object that felt like stone, that felt like dry ice or granite. When I touched it, I actually burned the inside of my hand, which I still have to this day. It pulled the skin right off of my hand. It was approximately 12 feet long, two and a half feet high, and three and a half feet to four feet wide. It had six sides, six definite sides. It had a surface that looked like marble or granite. No holes, no rivets, no windows or doors, and no landing gear, nothing to hold it up. And then I, re I realized that it was three feet off the ground. Yeah, Dr. Reed, let me let me jump in for a second because I want to show an image. Um, you were able to take these images, and so uh, and you can describe uh, what we're seeing here. Um, how did you go back and and get your camera? I mean, I, uh, briefly I, uh, share that with us uh, really quick before I we crawled. Go. I was crawling around in this hundred foot circle area where all this happened, where the body lay on the ground and to where I could see this black shape, I decided not thinking clearly, but cl thinking more logically, I thought I've got my cameras. When I took my water out, my water bottle to drink, I realized I've got my camera. I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to take all the pictures I can of this and in my mind, I said, I'm going to take them because I'm going to prove none of this exists. This has all got to be an illusion in my mind, and nothing will come out. I was an amateur photographer. I had re relatively good equipment, and I thought, I'm going to do this. And this felt comfortable to me because I had been taking pictures for so long. It was a pleasure. It was a knowledge that I knew how to do. And it gave me something to focus that made sense to me because this other business made no sense to me. Okay. So I, well, I, I just pulled up. We're, we're going to hit a break here in two minutes. Um, uh, and we'll pick up where we're leaving off. Um, in this image here, uh, tell us what we're looking at. This is the black craft or obelisk that we took to calling it that's approximately 12 feet long, two and a half feet high, and three feet to four feet wide. This was hovering, anchored to the air, three feet above the ground. Nothing touching it, nothing suspending it. I took the branch that I had and ran it underneath, and it felt like it was going through molasses at one point underneath it. So I felt there's got to be some kind of energy pushing this thing, holding this thing in place. I pushed against it several times. I weighed 200 pounds. It wouldn't move a fraction of an inch, not a fraction. It was anchored to the air in place. So I took many pictures of this from different angles, from close up to far away. Uh, I even have video of it. I had a small video camera that I took. I realized it was producing some kind of energy that was distorting the video. So the further back I got, the clearer the video would remain. I didn't know what it was. It was an incredible thing. But it, again, it was not part of my paradigm. I did not understand it. I couldn't comprehend it. But nevertheless, I had a job to do in my mind was just to take the pictures because it gave me a break from worrying about everything else that had already happened.
Now the uh, that tone that you were talking about, um, I, I would assume obviously it's emanating from this, and it may yes. be what's allowing it to uh, stay in position. Did it get louder as you got closer to it? Um, no, it pretty much stayed the same. This very very low ebbing harmonic tone, which was a little bit irritating. Uh, the closer you got, it was apparent no matter where you were but it was very very apparent and when i when i touched this thing when i kind of slipped and fell against it for the first time for a second just a second i felt like i was inside a big dark room like the size of an airplane hangar and then all of a sudden thrown out like i'd been rejected i didn't know at the time if this was just I was set losing my mind or if this actually happened. But the interesting part of it was that I later realized the tear in my shirt where I had ripped my shirt against the tree was no longer ripped. Like it was healed, like it never happened. So again, these are things that didn't make any sense to me, but well, nevertheless, it occurred. Well, it wouldn't fit in anybody's paradigm, right? I mean, I, yeah, we don't have experience. I, I, you know, I've done uh, 2,000 shows. I still wouldn't know what to do with this. Jimmy, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what this creature was. I didn't even put the name alien or extraterrestrial to it until after I had brought the body home and my friend was the first one to say, this is what this is. I didn't want to think that. I didn't want to go there because in my life, I dealt with hard science, facts that I had read and studied for years. I knew nothing about this. And so to me, it just was more craziness and my mind didn't want to go there. And these are so, uh, uh, really, really quick. I've got to take a break right here. Um, all of this was shot on film. Yes, sir. All of it was film, 35 millimeter film, both slide film and print film, Kodachrome, Kodacolor. Some of the pictures are a little bluer than others. That's because it was an ectochrome based film. Right. But this is film. This is prior to digital anything. Um, yeah, that's totally. What yeah. People Doctor. need to realize, I mean, Photoshop doesn't, didn't even exist in the, the mainstream until years later. Yeah, 10 so years then, later. <laughs> Let, let's take a break right here. We got to get this in. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed. 27 years I've waited for this conversation, and we're having it now. So stay right there. We'll pick up where we are leaving off, I promise, right here when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church on the Game Changer and NX Networks. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB. BX. Right now, Eden Pier is having their famous BOGO deal on thunderstorm air purifiers. One listener wrote, It makes a huge difference in our cat litter box stink. I just wish I waited for the BOGO deal. I need another one. Well, now's the time. BOGO is back, so when you buy one thunderstorm, you get one free. No matter how many you buy, you buy two, you get two free. You buy five, you get five free. The thunderstorm will completely eliminate any odor, even the worst like pets, cigarette smoke, urine, and cooking. Now is the time to order. Eden Pierce buy one, get one free sale is one week only. With over 265,000 thunderstorms sold and countless five-star reviews, you know it works. People are buying several for around the home and even as gifts. 
Just go to EdenPureDeals.com and use discount code FADERBOGO. That's FADERBOGO. F-A-D-E-R-B-O-G-O. BOGO is buy one, get one free. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Discount code FADERBOGO. And as always, shipping is free. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fade or not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, there he is, right there, Dr. Jonathan Reed. I got to tell you, man, I, I, I can't believe I'm, 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 I'm looking at you, you, the fountain of youth. Okay, so I, I, I can't get that out of my mind, Dr. Reed. So anyway, let, let's back up now. Um, uh, where we left off was Kodachrome, Ectochrome. Uh, that these images uh, were shot on film. I'm, I'm going to bring up another shot. And uh, th- th- it, again, just an incredible image here. Um, and you had said right before the break, we're talking to uh, Dr. Jonathan Reed. This is his 1996 um, encounter with an extraterrestrial and a craft and the death of his dog, uh, Susie, in, in Seattle, 50 miles outside of Seattle. Uh, back in 1996, October of 96. And so after um, the initial encounter, um, you were able to get to your, uh, I think you said day pack, get your camera and started taking pictures. This image here, 
Um, you had said that uh, you weren't thinking aliens. I, I don't know who would at this point. It, it's too incredible. But um, you heard a humming sound. You then touched this craft, burned your hand, uh, were able to get your camera started taking these pictures. Were you thinking um, at the time that uh, this was some type of spacecraft that this alien was in? Uh, and have we even determined that, that it, that it was a spacecraft or something else? Okay, at the time, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, at the time, my mind was not thinking about anything about other than taking the picture, the exposure, the f-stop, making sure I was laying, I took this picture laying on the ground on my stomach with my arms resting on the ground, creating a tripod, holding my 35 millimeter camera as still as it could, because it was a long exposure. This exposure was probably um, probably a third of a second long because it was such a dark area. But the film, the cameras was excellent in quality. It took great pictures. Uh, so my thought was just take the best picture I could. And I think that was done as a fail safe, Jimmy. I think I didn't want to think about anything else. I didn't want to think that my dog was dead, that something had killed my dog and that I had killed something else. I didn't know what that was. I was afraid as well as sick. So my methodology was nil to thinking about uh, spacecraft or aliens or anything. I was just only thinking how do I take the best picture I can? And I think that got me through this. I had a video camera with me, a little video camera, one of the first small ones made, uh, eight millimeter uh, Nikon video camera. I took video of all of this. I realized the closer I got in proximity to this black floating thing, the more the video camera would distort which drove me nuts because I thought, oh, God, I'm not going to be able to get this. So I went farther back and farther back, used the little zoom lens to get in close. So I have video on the scene that was taken within an hour and a half of me coming in contact with the alien. I have a picture of him laying on the ground with blood everywhere. Um, a step-by-step -step running from one space to the other, 75 feet over to where this was, breathing so hard I barely could could continue. I mean, throwing up during the filming. Mm. You can't mistake how sick I was, but I have that. I have all these pictures. I took every bit of film I had, which about 36 rolls, uh, or not 36 rolls, three rolls of 36 images per her role. I took it all. I took everything I had. And then at that point, I decided I got to get out of here. I, I got to calm down more. I got to try to regain some strength so I can stand longer and keep walking back out of this place. I thought, what am I going to do with this? I've killed this. I felt uh, afraid of what I had done, fear, uh, sick. I thought, okay, I can't bury it. I didn't have a shovel. I, I had a knife. I had a backpack with a few dog biscuits in it, uh, my cameras, and I had a thermal blanket, which is something that you keep with you in case you're stuck in the woods. It's a mylar blanket that you wrap yourself up to keep heat in your body in case you have to spend the night. Well, it was about eight by 10 feet wide. And I decided I'd open it. I'd put it over the body. Maybe I could put rocks around it or something to preserve it so that I could come back with somebody else and we could figure this out. As I did that, I realized the body, I, I slipped my hands under the body between the thermal blanket and this body. I didn't want to touch it. I did not want to touch it. And I wanted to cover it up so I wouldn't have to look at it. And as I did, I realized this thing is so light. It's incredibly light considering how big it was. It's like small child in size. And 
maybe I thought maybe this is 40 to 50 pounds at the most. So I put it under it. I wrapped it up. I kind of rolled it up like you'd roll up a sleeping bag. And I thought, well, maybe I can set it over to the edge of the path, over to the edge of the, the hill and put some more branches on it or something to keep animals from it or, or whatever. That was my thought, even though it was incomplete, even though it was crazy. That was my methodology. As I did so, realizing how light it was, I thought I could take the straps off of my pack, put around it, and maybe I can carry it back down the path toward my Jeep where I can find a better place to hide it and put it and store it. That's what I thought. That was the only thing at that moment going through my head and breathing, trying to calm down my breathing. So that's what I did. I put the straps around it. I picked it up in one arm. I picked up my pack and cameras in the other which sort of balanced me a little bit. And I started slowly walking back to where I had parked my Jeep. Now remember, it was like an hour back to where I'd parked. I didn't think I could ever make it. Well, all of a sudden, like in a blink of an eye, I was standing next to my Jeep. I don't know how that happened. I don't know if I blacked out and walked unconsciously, but I was there and it was comfortable. It looked comfortable to me. Like that's, that's reality to me. That's real reality. So I picked up this thermal blanket, opened the back of the Jeep, put it in, closed the door and sat in the passenger seat for some time. I can really, over, I, 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 I'm just going to jump in and say, I have no idea how you kept your composure. Um, well, and, 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 remember, remember, Jimmy, I was throwing up every 15 to 20 feet to the point where I no longer had anything to expel. Uh, I was starting to throw up blood. And, and again, my worry was my body. Am I ever going to survive this at this point? And I was more worried about that than anything. So all other functions were motor functions. It wasn't a logical adaptation of what do I do next? It was just, this is what I'm doing. And sitting in the, the driver's seat, I thought, this feels comfortable. This feels more like something I understand. But I looked over where my dog always sat in the passenger seat and she wasn't there like she always was. And I could see in the rear view mirror, the thermal blanket in the back of the Jeep. So I knew something had happened. I started the car. I drove toward the path of the road that I had come from. I knew there was a, a, a ranger station not far away. So I drove there thinking I could get help. I got there. I got out, threw up got out to their doorway, knocked on their door, but they weren't there. There was nobody there. I don't know if they were out to, to dinner or, or what, but there was nobody there. So the only thing I had left was to go home, to go back to where somebody could help me. This is a picture of the, the body, uh, yeah, the boots uh, and the skull. Yeah, uh, 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 Doctor Reed. Let me. Uh, uh, the, in in one of the previous shots, was that a piece of the uh, his skull sitting next to? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Right. It was still attached on one little quarter of his skull. His skin was actually holding the flap together, but you can clearly see the blood, the brain tissue. It had breached the intracranial sac, which put this fluid, which was basically water, if it's similar to us, all over. So I just wrapped him up in the woods as best I could, put my straps around him and carried him back to my Jeep. I drove past the ranger station. I drove home, which was another 40 minutes. It was now dark. Street lights were on. I drove in my carport. And I sat there for the longest time, just numb, just not knowing anything. And this was in the days of, you know, pre-cell phone 
ability. No cameras on your cell phone. In fact, the, ca the cell phones we had were wired into our cars. Um, I got home, I thought, what am I gonna do? I could see this thing was in my Jeep in the carport. And I thought, what? Well, I gotta get it out. I gotta put it somewhere where, where nobody's gonna steal it. Cause if they break into my Jeep, that's gonna be a whole nother set of issues. So I thought to myself, I'll just put it in my garage. I'll just put it in the garage. I didn't want to really take it into my house because the garage was separate from the house, a separate building. And I was renting this house alone. And I, I put it, picked it up, took it in through the side door into the garage. And then I realized, ah, my freezer. I've got a chest older freezer that had almost nothing in it. And I thought, well, that that's even a better place because I could put it in there and I can close the door. And so that was my thought. My thought was take out the food basket, which had some frozen peas and a few other things, laid it on the floor and lifted this whole blanket, the thermal blanket, into this older freezer and let the door close. The lock on it was... Uh, broken, hit or miss. So I didn't even bother to lock it. I thought, well, nobody's going to go in there. So I put it in there, but it was running. The freezer was running. It was almost zero degrees. I closed the door, went in the house and immediately stood in the shower, numb with all of my clothes on because I was a mess. I was just an absolute mess. That's a good call. I had to hit the shower too. I would have hit the shower, um, uh, and I'm not being in in any way cavalier, right? That's a good call. No, I appreciate uh, it. Here is this is the actual freezer in your garage. Yes, this is the freezer, and uh, it, like I say, it was an older secondhand freezer somebody gave to me, and it still worked, and it was small, which worked for me perfectly. But I never in my mind would have ever thought about doing this other than, other than when you have something that's meat that can be disposed and start to degrade very quickly in normal temperatures, what do you do? You put it in a freezing environment and it stops the degradation of it. It stop, stops it from decomposing. Well Jonathan, at, at this point, um, and especially I've had, I've had, tw you had a few minutes to think about this back then. I've had 27 years to line up questions, right? <laughs> okay. So at this point, uh, what were you thinking? Um, did you? Very little, very little logic, mostly based on that I didn't want to think. I didn't want to think about a body that I had killed. I didn't want to think that I had murdered something. Right. Uh, I didn't want to think about the fact that my dog was so brutally torn apart in front of my eyes and killed in such a way that made no sense either. I, my mind did not want to go to these things that I had just witnessed. So my mind wanted to go to logical things that made comfortable sense. Putting it in the freezer was not because I was thinking so much of, you know, preserving the body. I was thinking it's hidden. It's out of the way. It's easier than digging a hole and putting it in the ground, which well, I wanted to do. Well, what about the police? Uh, were you I, thinking I was thinking about all of that. I was thinking in my mind, as soon as they find out I've, I'm a murderer. I'm going to be prosecuted. Uh, you know, my life is going to be torn apart. And I didn't want to think much about it. So therefore, I thought, deal with it later. Put it in there. I was a mess. I needed to clean up. I needed to start to feel better. I, I cannot impress upon you or your audience how sick I was. It was to the point where I was throwing up blood. Uh, I was dehydrated. I could barely breathe without gasping and, and throwing up. Uh, muscle tone in my body was gone. Later on, we determined it's all the signs that a normal person would have if you were exposed to some level of high radiation. So radiation poisoning was 
is the definition of all of the things that I was feeling. Did I come into contact with radiation? I could have with this black shape. That's only years later in thinking this through with the help of many other people that are much more knowledgeable than this than me. But at the time, my concern was survival. My concern was calming down, getting some water inside of me, sitting in my shower, sitting in my home to where I felt secure more so than I ever had in the last, you know, four or five hours. I called my friend, my girlfriend on the phone. She wasn't home. I left a message. In those days, it was message machines. Call me. I need to talk to you. I called my best friend, Gary, who I'd known since high school and said, Gary, uh, come over. I'm in trouble. Susie's dead. And he knew my dog. Everybody knew my dog. But I said, I need you to come over, please. And that's all the detail I gave out. And, and I sat there, I sat there and didn't do anything, didn't turn on the TV, didn't turn on anything. I even sat in the dark and just drank water as best I could calm down. Gary came over, said, Jonathan, obviously you're sick. What can I do for you? Let's get you in better. And I said, but it, this is what happened and it doesn't make any sense. And he says, you're just sick. You're just sick. You're illusion." And I said, God damn it, I'm not, I'm not living an illusion. I will show you. And he said, show me what? And I said, come to me with the garage. Come with me. <laughs> so I took him out of the house. I took him into the garage. I opened the freezer. I lifted up this body. Uh, Dr. Reed, let me, let me jump in. I'm only laughing because he has no clue. Right. No clue. He thinks he right. thinks I'm just going nuts. Right, right, right. That's what I'm, I, you know, you, you got to be careful. And uh, we'd known each other for years. So we knew each other well. But he just thought I'm sick. OK, so uh, you uh, you open this baby up. What happened? I open it up. I lift out this thermal blanket, which is complete, complete continually wrapped up, laid it on the garage floor, opened it, and he just stood there with his mouth open in awe, gasping in awe, going, oh, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, and, you know, walked backwards and ran in the house at that point. And we got in the house, and I, I mean, I wrapped it back up, put it back in the freezer, went in the house, and he says, Jonathan, this is this is something incredible. You don't know what you've got. Do you know what this is? You know, and I kept saying, I don't want to hear this. I do not want you to label this. And he said, it's an alien. It's an AT. It's an it. And I said, I don't want to hear that. That doesn't make any sense to me. But he then he went down this road of what do we got to do? Where did it happen? I need more. Uh, evidence of how it happened what was the event so I showed him the videotape because I had the videotape the film wasn't processed yet so I just played the videotape and again he sat there in just dumbfounded awesome in what he saw and there's no question that what he saw both in the you know the woods film and I had videotaped, once I brought this thing home, I videotaped the body. I laid it in my rec room, which is the most light I had. I didn't have a video light. And I videotaped the body. I moved his head around. I opened his mouth. I opened his eyes. You can actually hear air escaping from his lungs. Uh, and I, the video camera I had, was again one of the very first original small video eight cameras but it had a viewfinder of about a quarter of an inch big and all black and white it wasn't one of the ones that pulls out nowadays where it's a big you know monitor so i was trying to look in this little tiny hole getting everything i could and again sick at the moment Later on, 
people recognize something that I didn't recognize. They all said it was alive. It's blinking in the video. It's moving yeah, its head. I, mean, I, I when when I, I'm going to tell you right now. Can I? I I'm going to share this with the with the audience. Um, I'm watching that video right, and I have no idea what's about to happen. And when that thing blinked, I think I hit the ceiling in my in in my living room. I mean, I I. <laughs> I went back and went, it's alive. Um, now, I just, this is a video. This is, uh, this image here is from the video clip. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's absolutely incredible. You mentioned uh, uh, you had opened up his eyes. And here is another, um, everybody, if you've got children in the room, and you don't want them uh, to see anything too crazy. But uh, here's another uh, shot here uh, from the video. And you're opening up uh, his eyes here. And you can you can those see are, those are surgical gloves that I had the you know foresight to put on because I really didn't want to touch it directly. Uh, and consequently, you know, it's dead in my mind. It's dead. I have dealt with. Uh, my family was a family of hunters. They, I went deer hunting with people and I knew what a dead creature looked like. And to me, this was another dead creature. And I didn't want to think much further than that, but I knew there were aspects of this that I wanted to see. I wanted to see it. I didn't do this thinking, oh, I'm going to put this film out for other people to see. I did it for myself. And in doing so, I mean, I didn't have a tripod. I had to tape the camera to a, a step ladder that I had, prop it up on boxes. And, and there's about a 10 or 12 minute video of me doing this, uh, you know, topical examination. And after that, I showed that to Gary in my house. We both sat there and thought, what in the hell are we going to do? What is this? What, what? And he was all excited because he was into this kind of stuff, not into ufology or aliens, but he had studied uh, enough um, sci-fi stuff and, and realized that this stuff was in our culture and it, and it excited him. Well, to me, it didn't excite me. Plus, I was really sick. And I said, OK, do what you want. I don't care. Just let me know what you're doing, but I'm not going to probably be the one doing this. So within the next 12 hours, he got on the phone and started calling everybody he could think of, the police, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, any kind of facility that dealt with weird paranormal stuff. But in those days, this is 1996, there wasn't a lot of stuff listed going on. This was kind of an underground niche kind of thing. Well, there was one thing that said MUFON. And neither one of us knew what it was. So we called them and they said, okay, we know what you're dealing with. They sounded reputable. They sounded knowledgeable. And they said, here's what you got to do. Preserve the evidence and bring some to us. Bring it to us. We'll meet in a a neutral place in public where you feel comfortable. All that sounded good to me. So the next, you know, four hours later, I was driving up to a restaurant, a local restaurant, and sitting down with them. Okay. Uh, let, let's let's take our break right here, and we will pick up when we come back. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, Dr. Jonathan Reed. <laughs> incredible 27 years and I finally get to have this conversation we'll be right back hi everybody this is Rob Halford the mental guard on jimmychurchradio.com your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB BX. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack. 
a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens, the believer, alien encounters, hard science, and the passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Dr. Jonathan Reed is our guest tonight. Tomorrow night, I'm off. I will be speaking at UPARS in Studio City. Wednesday night, Adam Apollo is with us. Thursday, of course, is another Fader night uh, with open lines all night long. Tonight, it's Dr. Jonathan Reed. Now, um, Dr. Reed, Jonathan, if I may. Um, uh, Where we left off, okay, so you, you reach out to MUFON. Um, and, and so you're, you're heading to this, uh, conversation at, in a public place in the meantime, in back of you, the alien body is back in the freezer. Yes, sir. It was what we're attempting to do right now is give you a quick timeline of about what happened in the first nine days from the event taking place on day one till nine days later. This is the most. This is what was chronicled in the book that we wrote, uh, right. Robert Wraith and I, and we'll get into that later. But yes. Okay. Uh, 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 and, and really quick, um, did, you, uh, did you know that the alien might still be alive? No, not at that point. Um, so, uh, again, move okay. on. Well, uh, well, that, that, on. well <laughs> let, let me jump in real quick. So you okay. are assuming... You've got a dead alien body in the freezer. That's what you're yep. assuming. And and now you're going uh, to meet somebody uh, from MUFON uh, right. to, to discuss everything. Got it. Got it. Okay. Right. Okay. So they, a guy and a girl, nice people, knew what they're talking about. Very helpful. Very uh, comforting saying, hey, we've dealt with this kind of stuff before. 
which made me feel good because I wanted to literally get rid of it, give it to somebody else to do whatever they were going to do with. And I, so I gave them some of the evidence, uh, gave them a copy of the videotape. Uh, they said, great. They made me sign a little receipt for it. They gave me it back. It all seemed all in the up and up. And they sounded like they really knew what they were doing, which made me feel good. Um, they said, we'll get back to you in a couple of days when the, then we will talk to you more about this. We'll do an interview, maybe a video interview. All sounded good. And Gary said, that sounds great. Meanwhile, I said, Gary was calling everybody. We were getting answers from everything that, hey, you're nuts. To people would hang up on us to say, we don't know what to do. And again, this was back in the day. This was in 1996. Uh, all within... Uh, 15 hours of the actual event taking place. I took the film to a local, I mean a local within a mile of my house processing place. We used to have all these independent processing places. They processed my film, my 35 mil film into prints. Uh, I had them all double printed. So I'd have a couple of sets, brought that home. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, there was a knock on my door and there were three people outside my door in suits in very unusual gray and black, almost a metallic look to their clothes. And they said, Dr. Reed, we want to talk to you about what happened to your dog. I said, nothing happened to my dog. And I, I, you know, just said, what in the hell are you doing? They said, we need to talk to you. And before I knew it, they were standing in my living room and they were weird. They were very weird, very uh, surreal looking. And the way they talked was so, such a melodic sing song. It was almost, I don't want to use the word hypnotizing, but it, it, it calmed you down to the point where you didn't want to think about anything else. And they said, we're here to take whatever you have away from you so that it doesn't bother your life because the next people that come won't be so nice as we are. We are from a group called the school and we have dealt with this kind of thing before. And they said, we know your dog ran off and got in trouble, didn't she? And they were telling me things that I had not told anybody except Gary, not even over the phone. So I didn't know what this was. They made some kind of gentle half-ass half threats. I told them to get the blank out of my house that I didn't want to, I was gonna call the police. And as they were leaving, they said, oh, don't worry, the police are with us. And I looked out and parked behind their car was a Seattle police car with a guy sitting against his hood. So they left and I went in the house and I was angry and I was still sick. And I got a phone call from my partner that I worked with at the University of Washington Medical Center in the psychology department. And he said, Jonathan, are you, I know you're sick. I know you called in sick, but he says, are you moving your office? And I said, no. He said, there's men in here with hand trucks taking out all the filing cabinets and all of your paperwork. And we don't know what they're doing. And that's why I called you. And I said, I didn't do anything. Nothing that should be moved. Nothing could be going on. <laughs> this was the insanity that was going on in my life. So they were emptying my office. Okay. A day, a, a day later within 18 hours from right. when I had had this event. Yes. And again, none of it made sense. But again, I said, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. And I got off the phone and I thought, I'm going to try something. And I called the switchboard of the medical center where I worked. And I asked for Dr. Reed's office and assistant. They put me on hold, they, a voice came back through, another voice, a different man said, we don't have any Dr. Reed working in this facility. 
I had worked there for going on 12 years. I was a department head. I had tenure in my department. So this was insane that this was going on. So I hung up, I went home, I tried to regain again what was going on. Gary was doing one thing, I was doing something else. I had started to ask people to come over and view the body. My parents, my mother, father, my, my girlfriend, uh, other good friends of mine, colleagues that I worked with. I wanted this people to help me. I wanted to take it out of my hands and give it to somebody else to deal with. So I had called a good friend, a physician that I work with, said, please come over. Somebody I really knew really, really well personally. He said, no problem. I'll be over there tomorrow, three o'clock, no problem. So I set up a table in my garage with a big light, overhead light where I could set the body, open it up, and it was easy to look at. Well, he called at the last moment and canceled. And the way he canceled, he said, Jonathan, I don't think you should be doing this. I don't want to have any part of it. And I'm done with it. And he hung up. This is not at all like this man was, ever. He was gentle. He never was abrasive. And I thought, this is in more insanity. But it made me mad. So I went out to the garage, took the table down, put the light away. And as I was doing that, I heard this scratching sound, at almost like the compressor was going out on this older freezer. And I thought, well, if that's true, the thermometer on the inside would be going up, meaning the te temperature was rising. And then I'd have to replace it or find a refrigerator to put this thing in. Nevertheless, or, or it was rats, mice underneath it, I thought. Um, so without thinking, I opened the door of the freezer to check the inside thermometer. And as I did so, the end of this thermal blanket opened up and his head came out looking at me with one arm coming to the side of the refrigerator, screaming at me with such ferocity, with such energy that it literally pushed me back across the garage 10 feet to the wall, screaming this terrible scream at me. And I just couldn't even imagine this. I mean, my mind was gone. I ran out of there, left the doors open, let it scream, went in the house, locked the door and sat there for about three or four minutes before thinking, I gotta do something. I gotta, I gotta, I have to kill this thing or I gotta, I gotta call Gary. So I called Gary, I said, Gary, we got a bigger problem. You gotta come over here. We got a big, bigger problem. And he came over and of course he didn't believe me. He thought, Jonathan, you're just, going through your sickness, you just find another thing to try to believe. It's probably nothing. I've seen it. It's dead. It's got a hole in its head this big. And I said, Gary, come with me to the garage. And he said, okay. So we went to the garage. We went out there. I opened the freezer, which the lid was now closed. And it sat up again and started screaming this scream at us. He was pushed against the wall, turned white, ran out the door. I followed him. We went into the house and, and for the longest time, never said a word to each other. Just sat there numb. Just, what, what do you say? You've got, and, you've got a shrieking alien in, in the garage. You say, you say, what the F is this? Right and, right. and I said, well, yeah, now we got a bigger problem because now it's alive and going to kill me for doing what I did to him. What do you guys do now? Do you draw straws to who's well, going to be in the garage exactly, next? Exactly. Well, I was hoping it ran away because the garage door was open. The lid of the freezer was open. We were both hoping it would run away. But at about an hour or so later, we carefully went back out there with shovels in hand you know, and a rake in hand to try to defend this thing. 
And sure enough, the, lever, the freezer door was closed and it was in the freezer. It was in the freezer. And I opened the door and it just looked up at me from within the freezer and kind of making this moaning, perky sound. And I thought, you know, it's dying. This thing is dying because I inflicted this wound. You didn't feel I, bad, did you? I, I, I felt terrible. I began to feel extremely terrible because I had inflicted this wound. Jimmy, I am not a brutal person. I will defend myself and my family till the end, but I don't want to kill animals. I've never been a hunter. I've been with hunters. I grew up with hunters, but I've never been interested in that. Mm -hmm. I was I was into preserving life, into helping people. That was my occupation. I took an oath, a medical oath to preserve life, not to inflict pain. And I felt guilty. At the same time, I felt sick and unable to rectify what had gone on, what was going on. Now, Gary was absolute new that it was an alien, that it was a big deal, that we had to tell everybody, and that was this, you know, a monumental thing. He was an architect. He was a highly skilled, graduated architect and, and not at all someone who would run off the deep end. But he was truly confident that this was an important thing for all of us to, to recognize. I started to listen to him. I started to see what he was talking about. We realized it wasn't dead. We realized it wasn't screaming anymore and that it, the cold somehow benefited it. The cold somehow may have kept it alive. People have debated over the last 20 years when I've talked about it, nothing can survive in zero degrees. Well, that's baloney. We have all kinds of penguins and animal life that yeah. believe, live their whole life in 50 degrees below zero. Right. So, so we know this is possible. Uh, we also know that there are animals that have split brains as we do as humans, and you can damage one part of your brain and your own brain will rewire itself to find ways to work again. So we know that's possible. That's not a, a fantasy or an illusion. It's a medical, you know, absolute. Um, so I was dealing with a lot of these different issues, plus these people coming to my door telling me that my life was going to be torn apart at the next moment. And I'm thinking, it's already torn apart. What can get worse? Mm. Well, it did. It went from bad to worse. And within the next few days, I'd go to the garage. I'd sit in front of this thing. It would get out of the freezer on its own in such a beautiful fluid motion, almost like a gymnast uh, lifting itself off of a, an apparatus or a high bar, sit in front of the freezer and just rock back and forth with these huge almond eyes looking at me, making these squeaky little chirpy sounds. And then all of a sudden I was getting pictures in my mind vivid pictures, images of things that happened when I was a child, like they were playing to me as a movie in my mind. So vivid, I could smell the grass and I could feel the air in the, in the picture. It was incredible. Uh, that's what this thing did. That's how he communicated. Uh, telepathically is, is what they say. But it, it showed me images that made no sense to me, geometrics that made no sense to me early on. But it continued to do this for the next four days. On the, on the ninth day, nine days after I had brought it home, it decided to take some water from me. I had given it, tried dog food, I tried all kinds of food, grass, steak, everything. It would not eat a thing, but it would take water from me in a little tin cup that I had. 
and it took it and it drank it and then it would set the cup down. Well, this day it took it, drank it and threw the cup at me, but calmly sat there and watched me, watched my reaction. So it was learning about me as much as I was learning about it. This, this presents the fact that this was a highly intelligent being. This was not a wild animal. And from then on, I realized I was dealing with something that was ultra intelligent and had abilities far beyond my concept of what we have had. And so I started to feel confident enough to interact with it in my garage. I would sit for hours with it as long as I could. It would put these images in my head of all things that I couldn't recognize. I could not discern. I actually had to say, slow down, because it was like a fire hose being downloaded into my head. So it slowed down its process. And I would try to talk and it would halfway, you know, make gestures like it didn't understand what I was saying, but then it would put these images back into my head. And this happened to the ninth day. I went out of my house, went to somebody else's house, took some of this evidence that I had because I now knew that they were coming after us. They had been in my girlfriend's house, my friend's house broken in, taken stuff. So I knew I had to get rid of this. So we mailed some of it away. I took some to another person's house. Well, in driving by my house, I realized there were big vans sitting up in my yard and there were men, multiple men taking things out of my house. So I wasn't going to go home. So I went to my friend's house. I called the police, told them what was going on at my house. I stayed there for a couple hours and then I went back. And what I found was that they had ransacked my house. They'd taken 90% of everything that I own, uh, put holes in the floor, holes in the walls and the ceiling. They'd taken the toilet off of the floor. Water was going everywhere. I mean, they literally were looking for everything. Uh, they didn't take money that was laying on my dresser, but yet they took the slides that I had there. They took pictures. They took my videotape. Luckily, I had sent copies away. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking. In that moment, I knew my life was, was being persecuted by these terrible people. Uh, again, they'd been through my parents' yard. They had lit effigies on fire in my parents' yard. Uh, threats were being made by the phone and people would hang up. Uh, they were telling me to shut up. Do not speak of this. Otherwise, your family will be persecuted and harassed and worse. So at that moment, because I had elderly parents, I decided I'm leaving town. I'm, I'm going to leave. Uh, Vancouver, Canada was only a couple hours away. It was a town I knew well. I'd been there a lot in my life as a kid. So I borrowed a car, I borrowed some cash, and I took off. And I left my home. And I ended up being on the streets and basically homeless for almost a year in Canada. What, uh, uh, what happened to the body? The last day before I left, when I went back to my house and saw that it had been ransacked, I went to the garage and they had pried the big garage door out of the wall. They didn't open it. They had literally pried it out of the wall, the frame. I mean, that takes a huge amount of effort and people uh, set it aside and they had taken the freezer. They had taken a cord of wood that was cut up and piled along the floor. They took all my tools, uh, things that made no sense. Why would they do this? Why would they take a cord of cut wood? But nevertheless, it was gone. Well, when I looked in the garage, I saw the freezer was gone, but I saw little frosty, wet 
footprints that didn't go to the door, they didn't go to the window, they went right to the wall, just like he had walked right through the wall. And in one side of my mind, I thought, well, they've got him, they've confiscated him because he was alive. But in another sense, I thought maybe he escaped, maybe he got away. Well, a month later, he materialized in front of me in Canada, and I knew he was perfectly fine. He had gone back with his own, however you want to say that. He had decided that it was time to leave, and he did, which he probably could have done almost at any time that he was with me. Uh, something that I failed to mention, the second day after I returned from the woods, Gary said, we're going to go back. We're going to get the obelisk. We're going to get this big black craft. So he took a trailer and his truck and changed. We went up there and there was nothing there, not a thing. In fact, the ferns and the underbrush that I pulled out to get a clear picture looked like it had been replanted, looked like it had never, ever happened, almost like the time had been switched in this place. Incredible, just incredible, but nevertheless, it was gone. So that was the last time I saw this black floating insanity. Let's uh, take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. I guess tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed. One of the most incredible encounters. I've got some more images, too, uh, that I want to uh, take the chance to uh, get your comments on. Uh, Dr. Reed, we'll do all of that. We're going to overtime. You knew we were doing overtime tonight. So did Dr. Reed. We'll be right back right after this short break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Right now, Eden Pier is having their famous BOGO deal on Thunderstorm air purifiers. One listener wrote, It makes a huge difference in our cat litter box stink. I just wish I waited for the BOGO deal. I need another one. Well, now's the time. BOGO is back, so when you buy one Thunderstorm, you get one free. No matter how many you buy, you buy two, you get two free. You buy five, you get five free. The thunderstorm will completely eliminate any odor, even the worst like pets, cigarettes, smoke, urine, and cooking. Now is the time to order. Eden Pier's buy one, get one free sale is one week only. With over 265,000 thunderstorms sold and countless five-star reviews, you know it works. People are buying several for around the home and even as gifts. Just go to EdenPureDeals.com and use discount code FaderBogo. That's FaderBogo, F-A-D-E-R-B-O-G-O. BOGO is buy one, get one free. That's EdenPureDeals.com, discount code FaderBogo. And as always, shipping is free. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db bx
Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed is with us. I want to remind everybody, tomorrow night, no show. I'm off air. I'm working. I'll be over at EUPARS uh, speaking in uh, Studio City, California. But Wednesday night, we are back with Adam Apollo. And uh, we'll be talking about the science of uh, uh, finding ET. We're going to go through all of that on Wednesday night. Our guest tonight, Dr. Jonathan Reed. And um, I, I can't... I, I just can't get a, a, enough of, of of this story in its entirety. Um, and I want to take a, an opportunity, if I may, to uh, to go back and revisit some things uh, during overtime, kind of loosen up a little bit, right, if, if we can. It's such an intense story. But uh, during those nine days, did you bond? Did you feel – was it was it a bonding thing? Did you – uh, I don't know. Is friendship the right word? But were you guys starting to accept each other? As strange as it may seem, yes. I started to feel uh, empathy for this creature. Empathy for the fact that he was so intelligent. He was had this ability to communicate. And he wasn't killing me. He was not being aggressive, which he certainly could have. I had seen his strength, his ability, his agility, and he wasn't doing that. So that, if nothing else, encouraged me to continue to try to reason with him and tell him that I was sorry for what I had done to him and explain to him why. Why in seeing my dog brutally torn apart would effectively drive me insane enough to try to defend her and myself. Uh, that didn't seem to contemplate in his head. He didn't seem to even want to deal with that in any way. He'd just go on to other things. Um, Jimmy, there's some things that we need to know about this, this timeline, this whole circumstance. The year I was away, I was depressed. I felt like I had to stay away. I was worried that my parents, my friends were gonna be 
hurt by this because they already had been affected. So that was the reason I left my community. I left Seattle and went to Vancouver. Living on the street, I, I learned very quickly that I wasn't in any comfort zone. I hated what was going on. I hated my life not having anything, going from having a really secure, productive life to nothing was, was terribly difficult for me. And uh, 10 months into that, I sat in a burned out building, an old apartment house where I was living uh, with a gun in one hand and a phone number that I had been given when I left, right before I left Seattle. And I was prepared to end my life because my life was over. My life as I knew it was gone. I was being hunted by people on the street that even had followed me to Vancouver. I had escaped them uh, by one grace of God or another. But I was living in the trees in Stanley Park, eating food that I was even stealing to survive. I had lost almost 100 pounds. So my life was uh, in shambles. So as I sat there in this basement with a gun in one hand, I thought, well, I can kill myself at any time. So maybe I better try calling this phone number because somebody gave me the number and said, you'll come to a time where you'll want to talk to somebody who will listen to you. And I didn't believe it, but of course I said, all right. So I went to a pay phone, that's a phone that's hanging in the middle of a public square. We mm -hmm. don't have them anymore, but no, we don't. I put in, you know, put in some money, called this number, and the very first thing they said is, Jonathan, how can we help you? And I was so taken back. I hung up and ran away and came back like 40 minutes later and called them back and said, Who are you? What are you? And they said, We're help here to help you. We know what's going on. We know what you've been through. We've helped other people like this. What do you need? What would you like? Do you need money? Do you need a place to stay? Do you need medical attention? Whatever you need, we will provide. And so, of course, I didn't believe them. I was arrogant. I said, fine, give me $100 in an envelope underneath this bench, and I don't want to see anybody around it. Otherwise, I'm walking. Well, they did it. They did exactly what I asked. I called them back later and I started a rapport with these people who never imposed anything on me except they wanted to help me through this. I even ended up going to a hotel that they provided me. They provided me medical care, food. I could actually stay there, live there. And eventually they talked to me and said, we can help you work through this. We know how difficult this must be. We have dealt with this reality for years and years. And these people, I put a name, I called them the Alliance, okay? They didn't have a name. This is what I gave them. They did help me. They brought me back in health and in mental spirits and said, you know, someday, you might want to tell this story to somebody, if no other reason, to yourself and put it in some kind of chronicle order. Maybe you want to write a journal, you know, about this just to get it. So that's how it started. I wrote that journal. That made sense. That's what I used to tell people in counseling, you know, go through this. It'll be cathartic. Well, it was. And so I wrote a journal. And after a while, they said, you know, you could work with a writer. There's a bunch of writers who will co-write with you. Even ghost writers will help you write this down for yourself. So I took their list. I made a call. The call I ended up dealing with, the guy's name was Robert Wraith. He was from California. He was a ghost writer, a freelance writer. I talked to him for probably 40 minutes on the on the phone and I said, I'd like to meet with you. I'd like to show you some things. He probably thought I was nuts, but he did it. He flew to Seattle. I came back down from Vancouver. We sat in the lobby of a big hotel and we talked for hours and hours. And he ended up saying, yes, I will help you. 
because I had no money. I couldn't pay him to do this. All I could do is ask for his help. Well, he did that. He helped me. He nursed me back to health. He made and got an apartment in Seattle, let me live with him in his living room. He fed me. He clothed me. He got me medical attention. And we spent over a year from writing my cathartic journal, which was about 12 to 1300 pages into a book that we call Link, The Extraterrestrial Odyssey. And it's available on Anaheim, 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 Amazon. Amazon. And it's a, literally a story of the first nine days, which we are talking about. It's all the intricacies that happen. Look, I didn't do anything right. I had no manual to go by. I didn't know what to do. So I made a lot of mistakes, but what I did was keep going. When something would present an obstacle, I'd, we'd find a way around it. Robert is the one who said, all of a sudden, there's this guy on the radio, Art Bell, you got to talk to him. This is what he does. He's the only guy in town in the country that is doing this. And he has this show on every night. You got to talk to him. So we sent him a fax. We just sent him a fax thinking he'd never answer. The fax said, dear Art, what would you do if you had a guy who had this experience, who had a body, who had evidence of this and, and factual photographs and video, what would you do? The second he got that fax, he called Robert and talked to him that night and said, I got this, I got this fax from Robert. And we're going to talk to him. Art was very skeptical. He got a lot of weird stuff in his life, but he talked to him. And within 10 minutes, he had asked Robert, can we get Jonathan on the show? And Robert said, yes, yes, we can. That was before we had any book written. It was before anything was published. So we weren't doing things in the right order. We were just doing things that would present themselves mm -hmm. one thing after another. And as you know, Jimmy, sometimes you got to take a risk. You got to take a chance. And that's what was in my head. My, what was in my head is don't say no to an opportunity like this because you're at the end of your life. I thought I was at the end of my life. And I said, I'm not going to say no anymore. I'm just going to do it. And so that's what I did. Um, I, I, Robert was a great writer. He found a way to take my words and go from black and white into technicolor. It's a wonderful book portrayal of me talking to Gary, my friend, talking with Robert, explaining all this. It's a very easy read. It's under 200 pages and it's available. What people don't know is every step of the way was a conflict. We took this book to several different publishers to publish it, to write it, to do all those things. One of those publishers said, okay, we're gonna do it. A Midwest publisher, a small publishing house. Within days, the publisher called me and said, they have burnt down my facility, burnt it to the ground, almost killing some of his staff. These became the obstacles. These became the reality that I had to deal with. This wasn't, you know, a little fun ET project. This was a hard reality of life and death. Um, I, w I was in, I I've done a lot of different things to make this happen. I ended up living in the place that actually printed the book. I ended up self-publishing because of, God's help and friends help who helped me put the money together because publishers for a first-hand writer will pay you 15 to 20 cents per copy when you're first coming out. Well, self-publishing paid me about $4 per book and that sounded a lot better to me. And my Jewish side said, that's the way to go. So I did. That's what we did. We printed, you know, a couple thousand copies from Art Bell, being on Art Bell, that triggered people around the country saying, would you come and speak at our place? I went to speak at a little conference in San Diego, the very first one I 
was going to ever speak at. There were about 50 people. They were very kind to me. I flew down there with Robert and a couple other people that became my team. I did it. They were happy. I flew home to Vancouver. The next morning, I went out to get a newspaper. I came out of the building in a parking lot, and a man walked up to me with a pistol and put it right in my chest. And I, not thinking, I thought, I don't want this to go off in my heart. I grabbed it. I pulled it away. It fired. I thought, okay, it's missed me. But the guy calmly put the gun pistol back in his holster inside of his coat and said to me, you need to learn to shut up. And he walked away. And I said, oh, I'm fine. The guy walking by said, you're not fine. You're bleeding all over. The gun had fired through my arm, through my clavicle in my back. And I mean, today I still have the scars and the proof of it. I've got pictures of that wound. I've had it looked at by police, by small arms specialists who said, absolutely. I picked up the nine millimeter shell that was ejected from his gun on the ground that day. The guy walked away to his van, backed up, and the government, the plates on his van said, U.S. government exempt. This is in Canada. So this is what I've been up against every step of the way. This was the first time I spoke. Then I was asked to go to the keynote, become the keynote uh, speaker in, in Las Vegas, in, out of Las Vegas, Laughlin, Nevada, for the International UFO Congress, which I'm sure most people have heard of. I'd never heard of it. Um, I was contacted by Wendell Stevens and Don Ware, who were some of the original organizers of this group. Um, I didn't know what they expected. I was afraid of my shadow, really realizing I'd been shot. You know, a month before, I figured I'd be dead if I went to this thing. I gathered a team of people who volunteered to help protect me while I was there. Uh, I only came out the day that I spoke. You know, I didn't go to the, the, the cocktail parties or the dinners or anything else. I sat in my room thinking I'm going to be dead. And I spoke to a crowd that was 850 people. You could have heard a pin drop. We did nothing like any other lecture had ever done. I presented the videotape from the woods, the videotape of the analysis of the body at home, the blinking tape. I had all of my pictures and slides. That was slides in those days. It wasn't digital. I, I, I've seen, I've seen uh, this, uh, I've seen the presentation. Um, okay. Yeah. And I was and I was scared to death. I was I was afraid. But Jimmy, let me tell you this. You okay? did pretty good. You did pretty good though. I want to say it was a good it, presentation. Look, look. As an outsider, somebody who's not into this subject, ufology. If I hadn't have personal experienced it, if I hadn't have been there and seen all these things with my own eyes and my own hands, hey, I wouldn't believe it either. But nevertheless, it occurred. That's what I'm left with. And when people say, well, I don't believe it, I say, that's fine. Don't believe it. But the evidence still exists. The negatives, the positive prints, the videotapes who have all been analyzed that were made contemporaneously to the dates of the events are all real. And I found some other things. I did a blood analysis of the wound in the creature's head. I took DNA samples and, and chromosome studies that I took to a guy at the University of Washington who I personally knew who was head of pathology, Dr. Roger Haggett, University of Washington Medical School. He said, what is this, Jonathan? I said, I don't want to tell you that. I want you to tell me what you can find out. He said, okay, no problem. I'll tell you whatever it is, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. So in those days, DNA chromosome studies were not done in a computer. They were done by hand. It took about a week to do it. We didn't have computer programming to do that yet, like they do nowadays. 
So he took it, took it hit to his lab, had other people work with it to present this material. I took it to him on literally the 20th of June in 2000, because we took some of this DNA evidence, put it in a freezer, froze it. So I still had this available. Gary had hidden this away. So I took it back. Gary and I took it back, took it to Roger Haggett. He did the analysis. He came back to me five days later with the results and said, I don't know where you got this, but I want to publish it because it's like nothing I've ever seen before. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, it's got 46 chromosomes, just like us humans, but mm -hmm. nine of the pair are different and they could only be carefully uh, registered to something similar to sea tortoise and dolphin. And in their database, that's all they could identify. This was done with three university studies before I did it. This was independent from me. And he said, I'm going to run the test again, Jonathan, but it's conclusive. This is not simply a human DNA. But, Jonathan, we don't have the ability to mix, to blend DNA. We can't do that. Our science is not smart enough to do that yet. So he says, I don't know what you've got but it's amazing and I want to publish it. I said, great, sounds good. I'm all for it. He went back to do his thing. Well, that was, that was the 25th of June. On the 27th, he came, I got a phone call and Dr. Haggett was murdered in his office by an unknown assailant student who walked in his office, shot Haggett in the head and killed himself. I had a phone call from his, Dr. Haggett's secretary. She told me a bunch of men came in immediately before she had called anybody and confiscated everything from his office, all of the paper, materials, all of his electronic materials, computers, hard drives, and took it all out of his office before the police got there to investigate the case. And missed the body. Now, who had the ability to do this? Right. Think about right. that. Right. And uh, I, I've only got uh, two minutes left, uh, Dr. Reed. Um, and what, what, you know, this is just part one, everybody. Just relax. Um, you sent me images of uh, the bracelet or uh, the, the arm. The link, link artifact is what I call it. Yeah, the link artifact. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop up. Uh, uh, we're gonna end the show on this because we're gonna come back for a part two. Um, uh, you sent me this image. Um, now, uh, did the and again. I've got 60 seconds, maybe 90. Um, how was this, this, with, okay. was this, this with the body? In, in the forest, when I went to wrap up the body, this was laying two to three feet away under the underbrush. I saw it. I thought it was a bent Coca-Cola can. I picked it up. It wasn't. It's a small cuff bracelet. Looks like it's stainless steel or aluminum. It's got hieroglyphs, red surface hieroglyphs on it. It's got three needles underneath. And I didn't know what it was. I put it in with the body and I brought it home. I've later figured out and found out through a weird process that it's a communication, some kind of communication device with either between the alien and the black craft and or his superiors. Uh, one reason or another, I made some stupid decisions and I put it on my wrist and it does function and it is a incredibly advanced teleportation device. And I have used it several times. Where, um, where is it today? It is in safekeeping where even I don't know its location, but I can get it through a process process of many people's phone calls 
and people only knowing a certain fraction of it. Um, this device was also taken to Russia by me in a seminar and used in conjunction with some of their scientists that were working on some devices similar to this. In Peru, I met a bunch of cosmonauts. Later, they invited me to this conference. I went, I talked to them. They had two volunteer scientists try to use this device. One came back instantly dead. The other one tried it later and died a week later. Um, it's not designed for me. It, it does do some damage to our body, but it hasn't killed me. I've tried to give it back. I've tried relentlessly to say, please take this people to Freddy, who I call the little alien. Please tell your superiors to take it back. I don't want the responsibility. And it has been left with me. So I have taken great care to stow it away in a safe, secret place. If something should happen to me, my team knows how to deal with this and can, can literally take care of it one way or another. But it's an incredible responsibility. It's not a toy. It's not something that you can just take out and, and be frivolous with. I believe that there is a, uh, an honor and a respect that has to be made during this. Um, something before I forget, and I have to say this, people say, well, what happened to Freddie? Did, they, did the people get him? No, they did not get him. He went back with his own. He's since come back over the last 25 years and revisited me, sometimes as much as once a week, appearing in front of me and other people. Uh, people witnessing this clearly, people who meet me, he will go to them in their house and, and materialize in the corner and just sit and look at them. Uh, it's incredible, Jimmy, it's a, but it's real, it's tangible as it, flesh and blood, blood as we are. He has the ability to wink in and out of our dimension. He has the ability to escape using dimension as their transportation. Uh, I've learned a lot more. I know where he's come from. I know some of their agendas. Um, and, we'll, was, and, and, and Dr. Reed, um, I've got to wrap because we're at the end of the show. Incredible conversation tonight. Um, we'll save all of that for part two and uh, <laughs> maybe a part three. I want to say I want to say that unfortunately the United States is the least helpful in bringing out information. They have recently asked me, invited me to present my case and my evidence before a congressional board of review. I am planning to do this under the right circumstances, under the right security but it's a step in the right direction. Is it the disclosure like we all want? No, but it's a beginning. And that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm telling my story. That's why I've never stopped. All I wanted to do was tell people, this is a true reality that can happen to anyone. It's happened to thousands of people all over the world. But I'm the only one that was either stupid enough to take pictures and video or lucky enough. My life has completely changed forever, and I believe it's for the good. Jimmy, thank you so much. Uh, I've never asked for any money. I've never asked for any donations. I do sell a book. It's available on Amazon. But God bless you for taking the time to let me talk, and that's all I want to do. And thank you to all the people all over the world who have helped me. God bless you all. Thank you. Jonathan Reed, thank you so much, sir. We will uh, get uh, part two lined up as soon as we can. Uh, be safe out there. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, tell Holly I saw her. And I will right. talk, to you. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. And thank you to your audience. Thank you so much.
Absolutely extraordinary night. Thank you so much. And I've got to get straight to the credits. Dr. Reed, thank you. Stay right there. We'll say good night in just a minute. What a great night on the show. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, we're taking the night off. I'm speaking at you, PARS. If you're going to be there, I'll see you in Studio City. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tepe.